What's going on, everyone? In today's podcast interview, I'm so excited to bring you Matthew Osborne. He's the co-creator of Scouter Q and Eflip. He's great friends with David Chung and Keo Broth. Had to, you know, I was very fortunate to meet him back in Miami at the Miami Sellers Conference earlier this year. And having had some conversations with Matthew, I was kind of just mind blown to be honest with you. He has so much uh, knowledge and information. He's a serial business entrepreneur. So I'm just so excited for Matthew to be here on the channel. So, dude, thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It was great getting to meet you in person at the, at the event in Miami. And yeah, I'm excited to talk today. Awesome. So I know that like most serial entrepreneurs who build businesses, you started at an early age. I know you sold your first thing on eBay when I think you were nine or 10 years old and you transitioned that into the traditional you know, kid business, which is selling lemonade, selling candy. I'm curious, are there some uh, business lessons that you learned in those early years that kind of still hold true to today, like building your company and stuff like that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that wasn't intentional when I was starting businesses, when I was kind of middle, middle school, high school age, is that I wasn't necessarily starting businesses to try and make a lot of money, even though I'd love to have made money. I was starting businesses to try and solve a specific need I had. And sometimes that need was I wanted money to buy X, Y, and Z, or sometimes it was something else. So because of that, I was able to start quite a few different quote unquote businesses. Very few of them made any money at all. Yeah. But I learned really, really valuable skill sets with every single one of them. Like, um, do you want to hear like a couple interesting random businesses? That started? All right. So absolutely. One of the first businesses, um, well, I, the first biz- business I guess I started was I wanted to, I love skateboarding. Uh-huh. I love skateboard brands. I was like, I want to start my own skateboard brand. Um, and so the only friends I knew were at church. And so I was like, it has to be a church related skateboard brand. I, like, I don't think those really exist right now. Right. So I thought I was clever in all my names. Like I normally do. I called it skate WWJD okay. and I made a website. And so I had to learn how to make a website. So I had an uncle that knew how to code and he taught me how to code. There weren't easy drag and drop website builders necessarily all over the place. So right. that's where I started learning how to code. Then I needed a logo. So I started trying to teach myself how to make a uh, graphic design and make logos and things like that. And then I had to figure out how to do print to t-shirts and hats because every brand needs t-shirts and hats. And so I started out that way just because what I saw as a business was just what you see on the outside, the the logo, the branding, the website, not necessarily that it actually has to make money. And so I just started doing that to try and build my own brand. And in reality, I just spent my own money, the very little money that I had. But I walked away from that with a cool custom skateboard that I spent a ton of money on because it was the only one I bought with my logo on it. But I also came away with the ability to start building websites and to start doing graphics design and stuff like that. And I had my friends who were all sponsored skaters by my brand. And so they loved that too. And so it's normal, like kind of, I guess, kid kid business. And then a little bit later on, I was a, I was a lifeguard uh, throughout the summers and even throughout the school year. And I loved to go to the gym. I loved to work out. I was really skinny. So I wanted to put on some size. And so I'd always, of course, sold all the supplements. I need this supplement and this supplement. But anyone that's used supplements knows they're super expensive. And on a lifeguard salary, when I'm not working full time, I couldn't afford it. So yeah, I was like, I've got to figure out some way to get free supplements. Um, and so I started thinking about the skill sets that I had. I was like, what if I make a website? I'll make it a supplement review website. I'll put up a few reviews of supplements that I like and that I currently use. And then I'll reach out to companies and see if they're willing to send supplements for review. Then I'll review the supplements, put them on the website, and then I can kind of get free supplements that way. So I did that. I used the skills that kind of developed to that point to build a website, made it look really professional, put a few good reviews on there. I was probably like 50, I was 16 probably around this time. Right. And um, my voice was already deep, but I knew if they saw me, they would know how young I was. So I decided to call people. So instead of just calling customer services lines, I went to, it was LinkedIn. I went to LinkedIn, found the marketing people from that company, found their numbers, called the marketing departments and said, hey, uh, I'm so and so. I own this website. You can go to this link and see it. We do supplement reviews, and we wanted to know if you have any new up and coming products you'd like reviewed. And I called That's like cool. twelve or fifteen companies, just all over the place. I spent one afternoon doing this. It literally only took me about an afternoon to to do all these calls. And then to my surprise, like two weeks later, I had boxes and boxes of supplements showing up at my wow. front door because awesome. people just wanted it. It's easy as asking for really is what it was. And so my parents were asking how much money I spent. They're like, "Don't worry, I didn't spend anything." <laughs> That's and so awesome. I got all these free supplements I could use, I could review, put on the website and stuff like that. And I didn't spend anything. And so that's when I kind of started clicking like, hey, you can kind of use these skills to, A, you could make money, but also just there's a lot of interesting things you can do and needs you can fulfill just by building these businesses online. And so um, then I went on to a few different businesses 
after college and stuff like that before Scout IQ. But those are the two kind of fun ones that I started in high school that really started turning the wheels in my head of what the opportunities kind of were that were out there. That's awesome. Now, what's interesting is all that happened actually after what I'm about to ask. So by the time you're 14, I know that you built multiple Facebook community pages with well over 100,000 followers. So clearly, you your found, huh. yeah, so clearly you found some sort of winning recipe uh, to work before you had any sort of formal education in terms of like how to actually build a brand and how to market it. So thinking back and reflecting on that now, what's kind of one or two pieces of advice you can give to someone like me who's trying to build a YouTube channel and build a following to help me, you know, make it like you did? Yeah. So what I learned from those Facebook pages is not something that really transfers to today, although I do have kind of an answer for you on that. But those Facebook pages were very early on in Facebook. Um, I don't know what year that was that I started those, but that was right after Facebook really came about. I remember when I signed up for my Facebook account, it was either 2007 or 2008, one of those two. I couldn't even sign up at first because you had to be a part of a university or a college in order to get an account. Yeah. And I was homeschooled. I was not college age. And so I just put, I went to BYU because I was lived in Utah. I just put BYU and they accepted my account. Awesome. So it was way back then. But then there's this weird phase in Facebook, maybe two years into it, where people started making pages because page would pop up in your feed all the time Mm -hmm. and say, like this page, like this page. Well, people thought that, hey, if I put some random joke or something like that, maybe people will click that like button and then they'll follow the page. People just hit like, but you're actually becoming a fan of the page. Right. So I started making all these random things like, oh, I hate it when my computer is slow or I wish the Trix Rabbit did this or I went all these random things. Uh-huh. And sure enough, when you make enough of those, a lot of those pop off. And sure enough, like I think it was the hate, I hate it when my computer is slow had at one point in time, it was over 200,000 people that had clicked that button and were fans of the page wow, without even crazy. knowing they had clicked that. Yeah. Granted, it doesn't convert to much because people are just clicking something that, hey, yeah, I hate it when my computer is slow too type thing. Right. Um, and then that's the only reason I've, I think I've said this before, but that's the only reason if you go to Matthew Osborne on Facebook and you look at my Facebook page for my, like, not my profile, but my business Facebook page that it has something like 19,000 or 32,000 followers is because I got one of those pages and I renamed it and just right. put my name and face on it. And so all those followers from whatever thing they liked back then are on there. So that page is absolutely dead. I haven't posted on that probably in a decade. Yeah. But no, they, they are real followers, but they weren't following me. They just came along for the ride as I transferred that name over. So those little things, though, did teach me something that helped me later on is that there's different ways that social media and social networks grow. And this is something that I noticed with Facebook early on is that they, things that are easy early on will normally not be easier later. And you can take advantage of those things early on. So for Facebook, there's little tricks like that you could take advantage of. One of the things we use, I don't want to jump ahead too far, but with yeah. Scout IQ that helped us grow a lot was taking advantage of TikTok. Uh, we were able to see that TikTok was in an early phase. They were trying to grow and there weren't too many people using it, especially for business purposes. It was solely right. dominated by dance videos and stuff like that. And so <laughs> when they're trying to expand to these new audiences with very few creators, the creators that are on there, have a significant advantage than what they're going to have a year from now, two years from now. So we took advantage with that. Same thing with Instagram from early on. Um, And there's even things now kind of forming with Twitter since it's completely changing and they're adding new things where it's becoming more like the Wild West again, where once they start adding video capabilities and all these other things, there's going to be a lack of creators for how much they're trying to push the content out. And you can really take advantage of those loopholes to gain a lot of followers. I know I did doubt quite a few things and especially even Scout IQ in the beginning with uh, Instagram. Instagram was super easy to gain a following by finding liked pages, commenting on them, commenting on other people's posts, interacting because there weren't bots back then doing it all the time. You were doing it yourself. And so if you interact on tons of pages that you actually liked, you post a lot of things, you could grow a following super quickly. I could grow a thousand people on Instagram in a matter of a week or two just liking, commenting, and talking on related things. That's not possible anymore. Bots made that ridiculously hard and people started spamming and everything else. But if you find those little, I guess, um, little hacks early on in a social network, and there are ones that keep going on later on, but especially early on, you can take advantage of those and grow an audience. And we did like a seven day or 14 day launch sequence with Scout IQ, the same one I did for another business that I started earlier that allowed us to kind of gain following quickly for that initial launch of the software. Very cool. Now, not necessarily a social platform like that, but Amazon, I mean, you you brief, it briefly uh, touched on the fact that when you built your own brand, especially for like the supplement business, like you actually did print on demand. So obviously 2015 comes around, Merch by Amazon comes out. I'm just curious, having heard that, taking advantage of 
you know, something that comes out new. Did you actually transition to Merch by Amazon? And are you still making sales Philip, today? Philip and I messed with Merch by Amazon. Reezy kept talking to us about it a lot. We started messing around with it. No, we didn't get any like major successful designs with Merch by Amazon. There's two reasons. So I think the first reason, the biggest one for me is that we were building Scout IQ at the time Merch by Amazon. Well, Merch by Amazon was before we started building Scout IQ. But once we got, got turned on to the idea we could make money with it and stuff like that was 2017, 2018, somewhere around there, or 2019. Right. And I saw it as a potential to make some money. Like Reezy was dumping tons of money into VAs to have them make tons of pictures, to have them all upload them. Right. He was making two or three thousand dollars a month. I think it went up a little higher than that, ten thousand dollars so a month at his peak. I don't think he's there anymore with Merch by Amazon. Yeah. I could be wrong, but I didn't see it as a great time investment when we could be spending the time right. building the business instead. And there's so many things we knew we wanted to do with the business where I was like, we could do Merch by Amazon, we could hire people and spend a lot of time doing these designs, and some of them might pop off. We might make money, but I really like the long term strategy of the software and just the Amazon businesses we had more so than investing time into that, not because it was bad or was a bad idea. Yeah. We just had other things I thought might be a little better to spend time focusing on than Merch by Amazon at the time. Very cool. Now, I know from doing a little research on you that you went to college at 17, you graduated at 20, which is, by most standards, a very early start day and a very early end day. So just out of my own curiosity, how the heck did you graduate so early? Yeah, so I graduated from high school early because I was homeschooled and right. just because we had so much flexibility to how I was able to do my schooling and everything like that, I was able to start school earlier and just finish earlier than the average person would because you get that flexibility with homeschooling. And then in high school, I took some club tests to get some college credits. I took some courses at my local community college. That way I graduated with some credits. Now, even though it sounds nice to graduate with college credits, I took like two times the amount of club tests that I actually passed. And so I failed most of them. I was not great at taking them, but I still graduated with a thing like 18 or 20 credits that came towards college which helped take like a semester off. And then I, every single winter, I would do a winter class, which is like condensed five-week, four-week class that you do over the different breaks. Um, so I did that every single semester. That way I could get those other credits. That way I could graduate in three years instead of four. And then I happened to be about 20 when I graduated then, just because I didn't see a benefit in staying longer and spending more money. If I could get the knowledge I needed in that amount of time, then why not go out and actually start working I loved college. I loved the experiences it gave me, but I was just really eager to kind of start a career and figure out what would what would happen from there. Yeah, I know you started a number of different side hustles. One of the one that's most intriguing to me is an ammunition subscription box. And I know that I was actually very successful. And I could be wrong, but I think you actually did sell it or maybe you're in the process of selling it. But what I'm interested in is what did that process of selling a business, which was probably much smaller than what Scout IQ and eFlip turned out to be, but what did you learn in that first beginning phase of, of selling that company, that kind of translate over to trying to package up and sell Scout IQ and eFlip. Yeah, so this could be a long answer. Cut me off if I start talking too much. But there's one thing actually I think that was really profound for me. This is the most profound thing I think I've learned in business in general. I'll, I'll, I'll shorten it for you so it's not crazy long. Okay. But I started a business right before the ammo subscription box business. I, long story short, I in college, I kind of decided I didn't want to be an entrepreneur. I had some bad examples of entrepreneurship growing up. I didn't know any, pretty much any entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. The ones I did were kind of always on to their next big thing and it never worked out. And I still remember like some of them like needing food to like live because like they didn't have enough, like just onto one business, onto the next that's failing. And so I was like, my dad always provided well for me. I was like, I want to be able to provide for my family. So maybe the safe bet is getting a good corporate job, moving up the ladder. And then when I'm later on in life and have money to save, kind of have a, a nest egg, Right. And I'll go out and start a business. So during my college years, I actually wasn't really trying to start too many businesses. Okay. I went, I got a corporate job right after school. I loved the job. I loved what I did. But that itch to start my own business didn't go away. As you probably know, as an entrepreneur, yeah, that itch you're kind of almost born with, it doesn't go away easily. And even though I loved the job, I loved what I did, that itch to like just do something on my own and build something didn't go away. So I told my wife, I was like, hey, I know we have a great job. I know we love my job right now, but... <laughs> What if I try and start something on the side? I'll build it up to the point that it can support us and then I'll quit my job. I'm not just going to jump ship and hope it works out. Right. Um, and so she agreed with that, even though she never knew me as an entrepreneur because we met in college. She knew me as, hey, I wanted to get a good corporate job, but she agreed to that. And so I was like, I need to start my first real official business. I'm an adult now. I'm not in high school. I'm not in college. I need to actually give it my all. And so to me, that meant spend a ton of time, spend a ton of money and make it look great. So 
I started with home fitness products because I saw there's a huge rise on Facebook or not Facebook on Google Trends for home fitness products. I was like, I love fitness. That's something I can do. It's a it's a rising trend. So I spent six months. I got a business license, registered my LLC. I made the best looking website you've ever seen with custom graphics for everything. <laughs> I worked with all these individual wholesalers, actually set up wholesale relationships. I tested products. I like curated everything on the website. It looked wow. absolutely awesome. I've never built something that I was as proud of of that website. I pushed that website out after working on it for about six months. I spent quite a bit of money, even though we didn't have much back then on this website. And it was absolute crickets. I didn't sell a single thing, absolutely nothing, not even a visitor to the website. And then I took a step back. I was like, yeah, I don't even have money for ads right now. I was like, the ways that I was kind of building social media followings before this weren't really working at the time. Yeah. And so I ran it for like two months, three months, didn't sell a single thing, barely got any traffic to the website. Um, but it was costing money every single month and all the subscriptions it took to run the website, the Shopify right. subscriptions, all those things. And so I had to shut it down three months after starting that. And, um, it was tough. Cause like that was the first business my wife saw me start. And I was like, this, this definitely seems like maybe I'm not cut out for this. So I knew I could either just go back to my normal job and stop trying. And maybe I'm really not cut out for it. Or I was like, what can I learn from this that I can apply to whatever I can start next? Cause the worst thing that happens is I fail again. I was like, right. this time I can't waste all our money doing it. So I was like, this time I'm going to start a business. I'm not going to spend a dime of my own money until I've made money. So until someone's paid me, I'm not going to spend a dime on the business, like which it. is where the ammo subscription box idea came in. So I saw that subscription boxes were rising because Harry, not Harry's, yeah, Harry's, no, Dollar Shave Club uh -huh. had just come out. It was like the first subscription box people really knew it was a new concept. And so a bunch yeah. of these were popping up. I was like, hey, so what could I do a subscription box on? I was like, I love shooting. I love ammo. I was like, I bet that doesn't exist. And sure enough, it didn't exist. And I thought maybe it's because it was illegal, but um, after doing some research, I figured out it's not illegal to sell ammunition, but thankfully I think most people think it is. So no one is trying to start this. So I decided to do all the research, see how much it would cost. I reached out to some suppliers. I wasn't spending any money. I was just saying, hey, what could I actually buy this for? And I was like, this is an interesting idea, but let me just try and grow an Instagram audience first. I'll just take my time, not my money to grow an audience. I posted about gun liking things, the memes, all these different things I knew people like guns would appreciate because they're things I appreciated. And I started doing the same type of thing we're talking about where I would comment on pages and interact and gain followers that way. So within a couple of weeks, I built up that 800 to 1,000 people on this uh, Instagram page. And then I started dropping little nuggets here and there. I'd be like, what would you think if you could have ammo sent to your door every month on, subs uh, on a subscription basis? Right. And people would be like, oh, that's awesome. And people are actually commenting on it, like real people. I was like, hey, that's interesting. People are kind of interested in this. And I was like, hey, if you got ammo sent to your door every month, what what rounds would you want or what calibers would you want? And people, hey, two, two, three, nine millimeter, et cetera. And I built this and built this. And how much would you be willing to spend? All of these things. And people kept tagging their friends. The page was growing organically. And I was like, people actually are telling me not only that they're interested, but exactly what they're interested in. Awesome. So I used the HTML knowledge I used to build a website because I couldn't use any of the drag and drop or e-commerce ones. I integrated with Stripe because they had just come out. Mm -hmm. And I could just integrate their code. It didn't cost anything until you started processing payments. Um, and I did like a 14-day launch sequence where I figured out I could give 20% off to the first uh, founding members that ordered in the first 24 hours. Right. And they would keep that for life. And so it's a very catchy thing. Hey, get 20% off your ammunition for life if you sign up yeah. in the first 24 hours. But a caveat, you're not going to get your first box for a month and a half. Gotcha. Because I wasn't going to buy it until I had their money to go out, buy the boxes, buy the ammo, and then yeah. fill them with orders. Yeah. So I did that. And with the first, I think it was two hours of the 24 hour period, I had about $3,600 in subscriptions for the ammo boxes, which isn't a crazy number. It's nothing life changing. But to me, I was like, hey, there's literally money in my bank and I didn't spend a dime of my own money. Right. I was like, I validated the idea. I had the customers tell me what they wanted. I didn't just guess and spend six months building something. And now I have the resources to buy this inventory without spending my own money. So that really flipped a switch in how I looked at business entirely of validating an idea before you build it, not yeah. just taking a guess, and also doing some minimum viable product where you can get something out there, test if it works before you spend all your time and money making it. And that's something Caleb and did perfectly with Scout IQ, or, well, the eFlip and we did the Scout IQ is we knew there was a need for it and weren't just building something hoping people would eventually want it because oftentimes it doesn't end well. Yeah. So long-winded answer, but that's yeah. the main thing I learned from that ammo subscription box business that really, really changed how I look at business as a whole. Yeah, that's fascinating. Now, I want to transition because obviously the meat and potatoes is how you guys got to, you know, how you and Caleb met and how, you know, development of Scout IQ, eFlip. So 
could you bring us, give us a little bit of context and like, because I know you met Caleb at a breakfast. I don't know the degree to which you actually knew who he was. If you guys were just kind of randomly met some random meetup or you actually had this idea in your mind, like, hey, this is a scanning software that could potentially be great. So can you give us some context about how you met him, how that breakfast even happened? Yeah, absolutely. So I was at a networking breakfast for uh, the college that I went to. So this was right after I graduated in 2015. Uh, Might have actually been right before I graduated. It was right around that time, either way. And I went to this networking breakfast because I had started going to all these networking events, not only because I liked the professor that put them on, and I was kind of good friends with that professor. Uh But I figured out that if I want to start my own business one day, which I was starting to think about that that might be something I want to do one day, I was like, I need to surround myself with people that have done it because none of my friends want to do that. I don't know anyone that owns their own business. So I thought, hey, if I go to these events, maybe I can find people that own their own businesses and maybe learn a little bit from them. So I went to this event. Caleb actually sat on the opposite side of this like huge round table from me. Um, I wasn't talking directly with him. I was just listening and I heard him over talking to the people next to him, how he had just quit his job in orthopedics to sell used books online full time. And the first thought in my head was, hey, it's someone kind of around my age that's doing their own business. I was like, it sounds like a stupid business, but he's making money from it. I was like, books are dying. No one's going to be buying books. So, but either way, I want to figure out how he is selling used books online. So after, after the uh, meeting the lunch thing. I went up to him and was like, Hey, as I overheard you talking that you quit your job, you have your own business. Like, that's awesome. I was like, would you be up for getting beers sometime? Uh, he said, yes. Uh, he gave me his business card. I said the book flip on and just had his number. <laughs> it was his first print because he had just quit his job. So he just printed out these business cards for his new business, right. uh, which was kind of cool. And so I had that business card. It actually took me like two, two months or so to actually reach out to him. Cause I got sidetracked to other things. Long story short, we met up we became friends. He had just, um, he was about to launch eFlip at this time. Um, mm-hmm. It was later on in 2015, I believe he launched eFlip. So I had no part in making eFlip, gotcha. um, but I was able to be there and watch him. I remember our first meeting, he was talking about the software he was building. Our next meeting, he was just launching and stuff like that. It had some success to it. He already had his book flipper blog. And so we really bonded over business because we both liked it. But he loved the data, the analytics side of business. He loved the actual selling on Amazon and building that. I looked at everything from marketing lens where I love marketing. I saw all the different things that, hey, this can be improved. We could do website this way, all those type of things, which he didn't like doing. He was the opposite of what he liked doing. So yeah. we kind of had complementary skill sets um, that that made our relationship kind of click, I think, a little bit more. And so I started a podcast in the meantime, interviewing entrepreneurs under the age of 30 to figure out kind of what they were doing to be successful. This is when I started that fitness website. I started the Ammo subscription box. And a couple other random things after that. Until in 2016, uh, I had built a website for Caleb previously for his empty shelves, his like library consignment model. Right. To, to help him with that. And he's like, hey, he's like, there's one app on the market for scanning books. It's been there forever. It's like optimized for Palm Pilots. I already knew about this app because I had started selling on Amazon because of Caleb. Yeah. Um, using eFlip and stuff like that. He's like, I think we could do something better than this app. He's like, everyone pays for it, but everyone hates it. They only pay for it because it's the only option available. Right. Um, it didn't look like it does today because they copied a lot of what we did. So it looked a lot worse yeah. back then. It didn't yeah. function quite the same way. And so with the, his knowledge of selling on Amazon, his d- data and analytics knowledge, how he knew to make these triggers, also with his brother that was a mathematician that was able to wire up a lot of the things on the back end for eScore, and then my ability to do marketing and we really launched the first version, the beta version of Scout IQ, literally using the exact template I did for that ammo subscription box with the, wow. the launch period, the founder's discount, which is part of Scout IQ at the very beginning and everything. So I was like, hey, this will apply just the same as it here to Scout IQ, That's except cool. we can use it for the beta and verify it works and people are interested, et cetera. And so it just kind of a mixture of those skill sets just worked. And so we became partners uh, during that beta launch and then we launched it and then we launched the paid version in November of 2017. And we had enough beta users that we knew that even if most of them left, we'd still be okay for me to basically leave my job and step away and start doing Scout IQ full time. And he was confident in it. And so right before we launched, um, we, uh, I stopped my job, I quit my job left, and we started doing Scout IQ together full time along with our business partner, Cole, who was our lead developer at the time. Right. That's so fascinating. And obviously the value you brought was all in the marketing, right? Was the pushing out to the the customer so it looked pretty, so people felt excited about it. And there's a saying, I think, that the best product doesn't always win. It's about the packaging and the way that people perceive it, the way that's pushed out. So I, maybe there isn't too much. I mean, there is a little bit, obviously, competition between Scout Lee and Scout IQ, but 
even thinking about like eFlip at the time, you have Zen Arbitrage, you have Master Book Flipper. It's like you have these competing uh, software. So I'm curious, to what extent do you agree with that sentiment that, that not always the best product wins, it's actually the packaging and the marketing? So yeah, it's kind of a double-edged sword in some ways because wh whoever's able to market better will normally get more customers. Right. But it's way easier to market a great product than it is to market a mediocre or a terrible, right. product, terrible product. So one of the things that I semi-jokingly, but not really even jokingly say all the time is like the Scout IQ is really easy to market for because it's a great product people wanted. I'm not trying to shove it down people's throats, right. which you can market your way to a product. I don't want to throw any companies under the bus because I think there's still value in this. But one of the softwares that comes to mind is ClickFunnels. Like it's terrible website building software, but they've marketed the crap out of it to where people are still buying it, they're using it, and then people use it for a while. They're like, actually, this has so few features that Squarespace has more to build a website than ClickFunnels, mm -hmm. but they're experts at marketing, so they make way more money um, because they're experts at marketing. And you know, granted, the ideal combination is great marketing with an amazing product. Right. That way it sells itself, and then you add on top of that, you just do multipliers. So we have a great product, the Scout IQ. People love it, they use it. We can do some Facebook ads with tic or TikTok ads or Facebook ads showing how well it works. And then it's just an automatic match where you're not trying to convince people every single day to buy your product. They're buying it and you're just multiplying it with the marketing that you put forward type thing. Yeah. So that's the ideal situation. That's the way I always looked at it is marketing was really easy with Scout IQ because it was a great product from the very beginning. And we tried to continue and make it a good product, but it just works better for marketing if you're not trying to shove it down people's throats. Awesome. Now it's funny because even though your strengths was the marketing, you still couldn't keep yourself from putting the hand in the cookie jar and selling books on Amazon as well using eFlip. So I know that you have done multiple, you know, many day part series where like, hey, let's see if we can actually make, uh, I think it was like $60,000 a year just flipping books online using eFlip. And I know that obviously the eFlip model, because I even used it back in the day, 2016, 2017, 2018. I know that the model inherently is try to find a low merchant offer that has a significant price gap between the lowest prime offer. And I know that, that definitely can work because people definitely spend more money uh, a lot of the time for prime books. But also I think for a lot of the newbies, people don't quite understand if they don't, under, you know, if they don't understand the inherent value of a book after looking at Kiba, they can get really in trouble, like buying a book that's really worth $5 and trying to sell for like 70, just because the only FBA offers that. So thinking back to, you know, doing your sourcing on eFlip for people who are still using that software, what would be some of the safeguards you'd put in place to make sure they don't go too crazy with, just massively trying to exploit the buy box like that. Yeah. So for, I didn't know you were using eFlip and Scout IQ way back then. So that's really, really cool. I didn't know you were using it back that far. So that, that's cool. You were there at the very beginning. Yep. Did you, were you a founders? Did you get the founder discount to everything? Uh, Scout IQ, do you remember? I think it was like, I think I was paying like $79 a month. So I'm not sure if that's what the founding, I don't, maybe not. Oh, um, eFlip. Yeah. For the eFlip. So I actually yeah. never used Scout IQ because I never did oh, actual scanning. I've only ever used eFlip. I talked okay, to okay. with uh, textbook outliers on eFlip. So, okay. Yeah, nice. yeah. But I, I did yeah. my first book purchase was, it was either late 2015 or I, I think it might've been 2016, my first book purchase on Amazon to flip on Amazon. So it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, it's a good question. So I'm not currently using eFlip in okay. like full disclosure. I'm not selling on Amazon right now at this time. So this, um, this is just based off of what I was doing before. And I know these principles still work because I know Amazon, I'm still familiar with Amazon and how it's working, but Yep. It's actually the main reason I made that 14 part series. I think it was a 14 two week thing challenge on on YouTube was because I wanted, first of all, for more people to know about eFlip. We had a lot of people using Scout IQ right. and a very small percentage using eFlip, even though there's a ton of benefit to eFlip. You can do it from right. home. As you know, you use it and stuff like that yep. if you do it right. But yeah. you can get into trouble way quicker, like you were saying. And so that's something where I wanted this challenge to, A, as a marketing effort, because we wanted to be able to route people from Scout IQ to eFlip. Right. Give them a 14 day plan of, hey, do this, do this, do this. So you can use eFlip, but also not get in trouble and hate us after you start using it. Right. Um, and then I go through a few different sourcing methods in that in that video of what people can approach. So the way I always like to use eFlip is I'd rather not spend as much time on it, but get the same amount of return for it. And so I would always buy higher priced books right. that I could get an even bigger bump on. But those books, like I say over and over again, you can get into more trouble with because if you buy a $5 book and you screw up, it doesn't sell for 70, you lost $5. If you pay $80 for a book, you're hoping to sell for 160, you can get into right. trouble pretty quickly. Right. And so it really comes down to knowing Keepa, knowing how to read those Keepa charts, having just kind of some intuition too. Once you get doing this for a while, as you know, you start seeing trends, you pick up on right. things, you start even knowing authors and brands and things like that. 
Um, but I really wanted to have the ROI in those situations where I was paying that much money where it wasn't like, hey, it might work out if it sells for this amount I'm hoping for. It. I always looked at it through the lens of, hey, if it sells for half of what I think it will sell for, can I at least break even? Because I always right. want to have the best thing possible happen, but it doesn't always happen. So with eFlip, first of all, start off slower, buy cheaper books first and move up to more expensive books. Right. And then the biggest thing I think is uh, really make sure your ROI, look at best case scenario, but also look at worst case scenario mm -hmm. and think through that. If the worst case scenario is, hey, look at back six months ago, it actually sold for $10 for a period of time. Then, hey, right. that might be the worst case scenario for you. It might yeah. drop back down to that. But if, hey, in the last five years, it hasn't sold for really less than $60, I'm buying it for 65 and yeah. I'm hoping to sell for 160 which is the average. And hey, That's you're it. a pretty safe bet. You can at least break even with that item. And yeah. so it's something you can feel more comfortable investing your funds into. But it is crazy, as you know, the eFold, how quickly you can spend money. It's a little addicting because sometimes yeah. you feel like when you're spending money, you're making money, which is not true yeah. yet. Absolutely. So you're like clicking on, I'm making money, I'm making money, you're stacking up the books. And then once you get them, you're just really hoping it works out the way it works. So tracking it is huge and knowing if you're making the right decisions, but also having that that margin in there, as Caleb Boy says, that margin of error where even if it doesn't work out how you want, you're still safe. You're not in the red for every single book that you purchase. Awesome. Let's actually uh, delve more into that. So you talked about tracking. So I know in that, I think it was a 28 or 14 day or 28 day period. I can't remember, yeah. but you have the eFlip series on Matthew's channel. You guys can go check that out. It's still very relevant. I'm not quite sure uh, how you how you talked about tracking, but I'm curious, have you heard of a system called Profit First? Did you employ that sort of cash flow management system? Because I know the goal is that you want to, you know, you want to replace a full-time income, but you also know that if you are doing this, it's going to take a number of months before you even start to see any sort of profit, right? Because it takes a while for you to buy the book, send to our prep set, it gets sent to Amazon, that has to be purchased, like, and then you have to reinvest money back in the yeah. business as well. So what sort of cash flow management system were you using? And what would you say you recommend now? So yeah, great question. So I have read the Profit First book and that kind of whole philosophy. That's not really my approach when I was doing this. Uh -huh. One of the things I talked about with eFlip is that eFlip, I always recommended people either start with Scout IQ and SOS, learn that, and then go with eFlip. Or if you're starting with eFlip, have some money in the bank that you're investing and know it's going to take a few months for you to get a return because right. even if you're investing a whole lot more upfront, so you're going to be very uh, cash flow negative at the very beginning. Um, and so it's going to take a little longer to get cash flow positive. And you're going to be spending a lot in the meantime. So if you've only got $200 in your bank account, 500 eFlip's not the best way to go about making money quickly. Right. So if someone has a decent amount of cash flow to hold themselves over, they know what decisions they're making and stuff like that. Um, it's really easy on the the spreadsheet that I forget if it was it wasn't part of the tracking spreadsheet. It was the analyzer we initially made for tracking uh, thrift store books. We could say, hey, if I get this number of books at this return, blah blah blah, it'll take me this long to break even. Right. And I think having that spreadsheet, I think it's still available on the hundredbookchallenge.com. I think that's where I have that calculator, which works for eFlip as well. Okay. Changing the variables of what percentage you think you're going to get back and how many books you think you'll actually be able to send in and stuff like that. But as knowing up front that, hey, this is probably going to take me eight months to get to the point where I'm making the amount of money I want to. You can have that goal in mind. You should be shooting for that goal. But if you're investing right. $100 a day, you should know right up front that it's going to take you probably three to six months to start making that back the way you're wanting it to, the way you're seeing your mind to make $3,000 a month or $2,500 a month or $10,000 a month. So knowing that in advance and then calculating how much cash you're going to need before you get to that break-even point and how long it's going to be from that break-even point until you're actually making the profit you want to. That way you don't jump into something, spend $100 a day, and then do the math afterwards and figure out, hey, I'm not going to recoup this money for six months. So then you stop spending. And then that amount goes down because you're not continually listing books into your account. And then you get in this whole situation where you make money some months, but then you didn't buy it for three months. And then you start selling right. it again for three months until you make that money. And so Having that game plan from the very beginning, even more important than the eFlip, checking that that calculator, seeing and knowing up front how much cash you're going to need, when your hopeful break-even point is, then when you can actually expect to be making that profit, making sure you're okay with that and budgeting accordingly, I think is really the most important part of that. And yeah, you can, the profit first, I haven't read that book for a long time. Who's the author of that book? Uh, I can't Mike remember. Callowitz. Mike McCallowitz. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I do like that approach. It's not something I implemented that, but I need to read that book again. It's been quite a long time since I've read that book. Um, is that something that you kind of implement in your life, yeah. that kind of profit first approach, how you go about your budgeting and everything else like that? Exactly. Yep. That's how I do it. Nice and simple. Yeah. Um, so you guys built, well, I guess now having talked to you, it, it, it seems like Caleb is one that built eFlip, but obviously you were very um, intertwined with that business. 
And seeing the success of the Amazon to Amazon flips, I'm wondering if you guys as a team start thinking about, hmm, there's got to be some other platform to Amazon arbitrage opportunities. So to what degree, and do you have any sort of stories behind any uh, software that you guys try to create for maybe eBay to Amazon or like Facebook Marketplace to Amazon, OfferUp to Amazon, some of those other platforms? So we talked through a ton of different options for doing that over the years. There was always something that came up. Like a lot of times we'd have this talk. I feel like this is a talk we had like, I don't know, every three to six months, we'd be sitting down and looking at like our game plan for Scout IQ. And we'd be like, what if we just use this data for ourselves? We could like mine this data and figure this out. I was like, sometimes it seems like we're selling something. Maybe we should just be mining for ourselves or trying to figure out a way to do something. And there's always a lot of different opportunities with that. A lot of the times we just focused on Amazon to Amazon still, just like eFlip, because if you know the numbers really well, if you know the e-score, if you're able to do those backend calculations, you can theoretically make a model where the the machine tells you instantly all the books that meet this criteria. You could right. click a button, buy all of those, and kind of almost send eFlip to automation on the back end, gotcha. which is something we had talked about quite a bit. It's not something we actually ever fully built out. Caleb did have a system, I think he had, had mentioned it a while ago, where he was buying books from the wholesalers that have certain books that could they wanted, and this is the amount they'd pay for them, and he could buy it from Amazon or vice versa, sell it back at Amazon. He and our developer, um, the developer that's currently with Scout IQ, did make a kind of eBay to Amazon thing as a test. But as far as I know, Caleb really didn't ever even use that much himself. He used that because he wanted to kind of test out this new developer is right after we had met him. And so he made that business. But no, we never spent, at least I never spent a ton of time with one of those because we never made out a fully functional tool that we're like, yes, this is something we could do, make a lot of money with. We talked about it a lot, but we always had so much other stuff planned that we just decided that we always ended up deciding to keep with our current roadmap and to kind of venture to this fun side project and see how it goes. Because one of the things I loved about Scout IQ, it was frustrating and I loved it, is that everyone always gave us feature ideas or, hey, can you do this with Scout IQ or can you do this with Scout IQ? And for Scout IQ, for us, it was never a problem of what should we implement next or what should we do? We kind of had game plans going out like two years, all the features mm-hmm. we knew we wanted, how we yeah. wanted to implement it. It's development that takes so much time and all the roadblocks yeah. and then Google Play updates this and breaks it for half the phones and we got to redo that, which causes this bug and we got to fix that. And then this feature is halfway built so we can't go on to the next one yet. And so it all kind of cum- culminates into like these development bugs where like everyone's like, hey, why haven't you done this? It's like, yes, we know about that. We just, it's further along in our game plan. We haven't quite gotten there yet. Right. So when these ideas for eBay to Amazon or Amazon to eBay, all these things that come up, we just kind of went to, I think I did in my head, I think Caleb did too, is we have all this development work we need to do that's backlog. So we can shift our development focus right. to this random tool to see if it works, or we can keep the right. game plan we kind of know is there. And we just always diverted attention to keeping the current game plan we had in place. And I think most of the time that was the right decision, although it was very tempting as it is all entrepreneurs to follow the shiny object and try something new. Yeah, um, But I'm, I'm happy we we didn't always do that. Yep. So your main competition, obviously, was Scout IQ with Scout Lee. From my understanding, Scout Lee existed before you guys did, but... Scouting kind of copied a lot of the things that you did as soon as you actually started becoming more popular because you were a better scanning app. And then you also had competition uh, for eFlips. You also had Zen Arbitrage, which was probably the biggest one. Now you have Master Book Flippers. I'm curious, as you guys were developing and thinking about plans for the future, to what extent did you guys balance, uh, you know, innovating new ideas and making sure that, you know, you you had uh, authentic, unique ideas versus like peeking over the shoulder and like looking at what the competitions do and try to just match them? Yeah. So this is something we talked about a whole lot. It was always a topic of focus. And Mm -hmm. what we ultimately always came back to is that Caleb sold on Amazon. I actually sold on Amazon. It wasn't just kind of a show we did on the front. Caleb also sold a lot more than I did on Amazon. And then later on, David, of course, came part of the team and he sells a ton on Amazon. It's like we were actually out there. I was actually out there using the scanning app. We were scanning books. We were listing them into our account. We knew our own pain points. And so the majority of Scout IQ's features and even the inception of Scout IQ with Caleb having the idea was based on pain points we had as Amazon sellers or Caleb had using the other app. We're like, hey, I needed to do this. I wish I had this data point. Let's make that. And so it's almost cheating in a sense because we knew the problems our customers were facing. So we already had a list of things we wanted. And it's not necessarily rocket science either. Everyone has this idea where everyone's using the app like, hey, what if I could just click a button and list it from the app? It's like, yes, we've had that idea before. It's not a, not a brand new idea. <laughs> um, it's something that hopefully down the road, it's something that we're implementing and stuff like that. And so we a lot of times had this point where like, it's really, it's a bummer. They just copied this. We spent six months building this. 
we designed it and then literally pixel for pixel, it looks the same. They copied everything. They just never had to go through the process of testing it and making sure it worked and working with users and actually developing it. They could just look at what we did, copy it, which is way faster process than actually doing all the normal development with it. And it was annoying, but it was going to be a bigger distraction for us to try and either pursue legal things against them or to just focus right. on them. Then awesome. I was always under the impression if we're the best we can be for our customers and actually implementing things we know we want in our business, we're going to win in the right. long game. We're teaching, we're instructing, we're out there in public. We're building it and we know what we're building in the future. We already have a roadmap where Scout League is just hoping they can copy the next great thing we do. So I'd always rather be the innovator than the copier, even though it is annoying. I don't think companies like that ever win in the long run. They can tag along and certainly they got some growth from just copying what we did. But ultimately, I think we had a much larger customer base and definitely a much more engaged customer base because we're actually right. teaching, selling on Amazon ourselves and then building the software as a result of that. Awesome. So the next juicy topic I want to talk about is the counterfeit textbook world. I know that pretty much all of us have had an account suspended. We've had account shutdowns. I mean, obviously, you know, back in 2017, 2018, there's tons of counterfeit uh, textbooks on the marketplace. It makes sense because, you know, textbooks are so expensive. But, um, you know, just watching the one of the most recent videos you had posted on your channel, the experience that you had gone through with your account shut down for basically a year and having to go through the process of like the law firm saying, hey, we want a six figure amount by a like, in order just to get your Amazon account back. Yeah, I know yeah. in that video, you said you had to end up paying around $12,000 to sell everything. But I guess my question here is, do you have any counterfeit related stories from the background of being part of the Scout IQ team, being part of the eFlip team that you can feel good about sharing? Because I obviously know that you probably can't share some stuff, but you're well connected. You know, yeah. you know David, you know, probably you probably talked to law firms. You have this unique base of tons and tons of customers of Scout IQ. So what would you be willing to share? Uh, it'd be fascinating to listen to. Yeah, so I could obviously share a whole lot more if it was just you and me that I, that I can't publicly, but there's still some stuff I can share. Right. Sometime next time we see each other in person, ask me the same question and I can okay. maybe elaborate a little bit more. Awesome. Uh, but we had a very unique perspective, I feel like, on the whole law firm shutting down people's accounts, everything like that, because it didn't just happen to us. We literally had thousands of people. We could go say, hey, it happened to you. What happened? We could see, hey, their account got shut down because we have keys to their accounts. You can see if an account has been shut down, they reach out to us. They ask us, hey, we know you guys sell on Amazon to make the app. What do you recommend type thing? So right. because of that, we were able to spot a ton of trends of how their purchasing was happening, what type of accounts they were targeting, and also how they had very different ways of going about these accounts of what they would do afterwards. Some people, they got their account shut down, they appealed it, it kind of just went back, but they couldn't sell popular textbooks anymore. Some people never heard from the law firm. Some people got a call from the law firm and it very much kind of seemed to us, and I, I don't think this is bad to say, but very much seemed to us based on what we talked to is they would kind of establish how big a seller was and how much they were selling and then very much adjust what they wanted based on how much yeah. they think that seller was selling. So. Right. Someone might be said, hey, we want $500 per book. Someone else might say, hey, we need $10,000 per book that you counterfeited yeah. type thing or more than that. Yeah. Based on the sales velocity, I think you're having, how much sales you had and right. how big your business was. Basically, how much money can we kind of get out of the person? And so I never had a, from the very beginning, a great feeling of the law firm personally. I know some people think, hey, they're actually out there catching counterfeits. I'm sure they were doing some of that. A lot of the things I knew, especially the stories that I heard, is that a lot of times publishers have a very difficult time figuring out counterfeits from non-counterfeits. Right. Sometimes it makes me question whether all of these are actually counterfeits or if they're maybe right. just normal books that are being flagged as counterfeits type thing. But right. I have no way of answering that because they don't, they don't release these books back to you for inspection. They say, hey, your account's shut down. Amazon agrees with them. And then you have to work with them to get your account back. The reason why I still sold restricted textbooks is because at the time I wasn't really selling restricted textbooks, even though I had an account that was old enough to, and I'm assuming you did too, your account I got did. shut down at some point in time, yeah. is in my head, I was like, first of all, I'm not intending to ever sell a counterfeit book. I'm not like trying to do something right. shady where I need to be worrying about that. I want the books that are listed onto my account to have some type of checks to make sure, hey, I'm not blatantly sending in counterfeit books from overseas type thing. Right. But I was like, hey, if I'm able to sell these books, I'm trying to do the right things as far as weeding out potentially counterfeit books, then why not use that opportunity to have my Amazon account? They're like, worst thing comes to worst. They shut down my account. I do an appeal. I get the account back. I just can't sell popular textbooks anymore. Right. I was like, I, in my opinion, it was like better to do that than just never sell popular textbooks because then there's no advantage to having that in my account anyways. Right. And so that's when I partnered with Avery and yeah, other sellers and stuff like that to um, work with them because a lot of other people had accounts built 
started way after they couldn't sell popular textbooks. Right. And it worked out for a long time. But as you know, if you watch that video, the, the yep. process that I went through was very different than the process people yep. were going through. Yeah, I'm through. not sure if it was specific to my case yeah, or if it was um, just something how they changed the process. But for those that are listening that didn't watch other video and stuff like that is I wasn't able to appeal my account. Amazon said your account is permanently shut down basically until the law firm gives us approval to reactivate it. And so right. it took about a year of back and forth and negotiation until we figured out something that seemed worth it. And there was a period of time since I wasn't really selling too much. I was mainly doing consignment on my account where I was like, is it worth it to even get my account back? Because right. at this time we knew we were selling Scout IQ and New Price and eFlip and all of that. Yeah. And I was like, it's, it's a decent amount of money if I'm not selling on Amazon right now. But ultimately, one of the things I kept going back to is I know in some way, shape, and form, I'll probably be doing something on Amazon in the future. And yeah. in theory, according to their terms of service, once your account gets shut down, you as a person you can never sell on Amazon again. Right. So everyone was always like, hey, if my account gets shut down, I start another one. It's like, you can. But I personally would really hate building a large business, like being in David's shoes, having a super large business with like 30 employees and being like, Hey, if they ever figure out I'm the same person, my whole business can go away in an instant. I'd rather my account be free and clear. So if I ever chose to start another Amazon business, I'm not worrying my, my identity might be found out and my account shut down one day type thing. So to me, it was worth it to pay for that peace of mind. And that's why I ultimately paid and my account was able to come back online. Of course, I'm not able to sell popular textbooks on that account anymore, uh, which I wasn't planning to after all of that went down anyways. But um, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. They, the law firm might be actually taking real counterfeits off the market. I'm sure they are getting some, but I don't have as good of a view of their intentions as a lot of people do, especially since they're their main clients, the main textbook manufacturers who would very much like people to buy their books brand new for full right. price than buy them from you or me where they're not making any money in the, in the process. And so right. the motives don't seem to quite line up with the actions that are taken, just in my view. Yeah. Now, I don't, I can't sell popular textbooks. That was the consequence of me getting suspended back in 2021. I was actually able to appeal with a plan of action. It took months for me to get it back. Amazon held a paycheck of like, I think $7,000 for multiple months. Fortunately, I was able to get it back. But I have a ton of people who come to my channel, like I can't sell these books and they're super bummed out. And I really tell them like, you should be happy that you can't sell these books because if you could sell these books, you probably would get yeah. test bought out and then your account would be suspended. I'm curious yeah. how... If you cannot sell the popular textbooks, would you worry about still selling textbooks? Because you can still sell quite a lot of textbooks. Do you think yeah. in the future that the law firm might expand their reach to these textbooks that are not, you know, in the quote unquote popular textbook category? Yeah, it's it's always pop possible to do that. I know right now they actually still do that to an extent because I think they've said they've said multiple calls that I know people have said that they have books that they monitor that are not on the restrict Amazon's marked as restricted things. Like they actively monitor books that people don't think of as either textbooks or restricted in general. So right. you automatically run the risk of that with selling on Amazon books or DVDs or anything else like that in general. Yeah. Um, but in my view, it's not worth worrying about so long as you're actually doing your checks, making sure you're not purposefully doing anything because especially with counterfeit books, you can't be... In civil court, you can be convicted of something. In criminal court, you're not going to be held criminal liable for anything if you didn't purposefully intend to do it. Right. And they can't prove you purposefully intend intend to break the law. Right. So as long as you're not purposely intending to break the law, you might get some civil charges against you one day, but you're not yeah. going to jail. You don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Unless this law firm could prove that, hey, you purposely knew this was counterfeit, bought it, sold it. We can prove you knew it was counterfeit. Then you might have criminal charges against you one day. But the worst thing that would happen is you have a civil suit against you but what ultimately, and this is just my opinion here. This is not legal advice or anything like that. But my opinion is, the law firms that the law firm that works for these textbook manufacturers want to get sellers off the market. They don't want to spend a ton of their time and money individually suing every single person they come in right. contact with. They want to get your account shut down so you can't do it anymore. They have one more seller off the market and they go on to the next person. So their ultimate goal is not to sue as many people as possible. Right. And I highly doubt it ever becomes their goal. Their goal is to get you to stop selling these items and then they go on to the next person. So right. I don't think people have to be worried about the law firm in the sense that, hey, I'm going to be sued if they accidentally find something they say is counterfeit. I think that's highly unlikely. Right. Uh, I think the most likely scenario is you can't sell it anymore and then you move on with your business. And so I'm, I wouldn't worry at all about selling normal items because you might get shut down one day, but likely you're not going to. And the law firm is not going to care too much about you unless you're someone like me that was selling tons of these books and then they really don't like you for selling a lot of them. So. 
you know? Yeah. And then also you are a public figure in some sense. So they probably also were able to connect it out somehow. I know Avery was, you know, he's obviously a public figure as well. So there's that to it. Now, this next segment, I think is really fascinating because I don't know how you're going to view it. But what I want to do is basically give you two app ideas, two application ideas. And obviously you build apps, you had multiple businesses. So I want, I'm just curious to know how dumb you think these are, how viable you think they are. And you can just kind of pick them apart as whether they're interesting or not. So first, idea is that we know that there are tons of buyback companies and traditionally buyback companies offer cash for textbooks. But what if instead, Matthew, we could offer experience for your textbook? So at the end of the quarter, we can have college students take a short survey, figure out what they're interested in. They can list all their textbooks into our software. We can get a total cart value that they don't see as a dollar amount. We can say, hey, you, Matthew, really like video games. We'll give you a brand new Nintendo Switch in this video game for your textbooks. What do you think about that? And so the the business intent of that would be whatever you're giving them is of, of course, lesser value than whatever the textbooks are worth. So it's an or, item. Yeah, or, or equal right? value to the cash value. But the idea is just how do you stand out for like, kind of how do you how do you build a blue yeah. ocean kind of a thing? So how do you stand out from the rest of the yeah. crowd? No, I think that's a really interesting idea, mainly because of course the students like money, but a lot of them didn't pay for their books in the first place. A lot of right. times as parents have been paying for that. So it's kind of like, hey, if I get money, there's a chance of giving this money back. Or I could sell these books and, hey, I can get a Nintendo Switch or a PlayStation or the iPhone 14 or something like that. Where it's almost, if I were to do an app like that, I think I'd almost set it up like a lottery system where you, you hit the wheel, it spins, and then you get an item that was like a dollar amount. Maybe you can respin one time, but that's the only time you can respin. And then you choose to accept or reject type things. It almost adds like a lottery type thing into it. Interesting. Uh, and so people will add their next book in to see if they get something better for the next book, or they can put them all together and hope they get something really big type thing. Yeah. Uh, no, that would definitely be an interesting way to stand out. Now, winner, loser, or needs a lot of work. What do you think? It probably needs a lot of work. It definitely needs some fleshing out. And, yeah. uh, but it would be a very interesting thing, I feel like, to try. The cool thing about an app like that, it's a very easy thing to try locally for one specific campus because it's right. uh, you can make a very simple, minimum viable type app for that, or even a website. Right. Hey, Web apps are way cheaper to make than actual mobile apps. So a web app people can log into on their phone. It has that basic feature. They can type in the ISBN. Some of it would probably be manual labor on the back end. But right. you'd get an idea real fast if it's worth actually spending a lot of time and money investing in. People might love it. People might not love it as much. You're going to have to do some in-person research to see how much people like it. But I do like where you're coming from. It's something very different than what people are doing right now. And it's very different from the other buyback companies. Yeah. Um, and also, if you have the systems in place to supply those items and everything, that's not necessarily a crazy, easy thing to duplicate quickly. It's not like the other companies can easily copy that right away. So you do have a little bit of an advantage that way as well, because there's a little more of a barrier to do that type of business. Awesome. Interesting. But no, I, I would flesh it out and see with a very small audience if it actually had any <laughs> bearing before you really build an app out for it. But okay. it's, it's got potential, I think. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. All right. Number two. So what about a social network for college students to swap and exchange textbooks? So we all know that college students are the source of all textbooks. They sell to a buyback company. They sell it back to the bookstore. They throw it in the dumpster or whatever. What if you could have a social network with a network effect where you have a whole bunch of college students from all around the U.S. log onto one app and they can literally trade their textbooks and maybe in, in the way that we make money is you make money off of each exchange of the textbook. So student A, trades their textbook that's worth $50 to student B who lives all the way across the country. And literally, maybe they just pay the shipping, but they get to exchange their textbooks. What do you think about that? I don't like that as much as the first idea. That's just, okay. just my opinion, because yeah. I almost think it's kind of like, that's the reason money was kind of created. That's the way we use money is because just because you need a haircut doesn't mean that I do too. I might need shoes. You might need a haircut. So we can create money and then I can buy my shoes. You can pay yeah. for your haircut, I think. Because there's definitely going to be students where that happen to, I need this book, you need this book, we happen to have the same one. But I feel like that overlap is pretty rare where you need a few different intermingling transactions for that to work. Gotcha. Yeah. In which case, it would probably be easier and simpler from a business standpoint just to pay money or to charge the textbook. But I'm willing to say that I, I could be wrong with that. One of the most annoying things about business ideas, and <laughs> Caleb talks about this, I talk about, is you really can make money doing anything. So yeah. every time I hear a crazy app idea, I'm always like, in my head, I wouldn't invest in that maybe, or I wouldn't do that. But I yeah. wouldn't be surprised if you figured out some way to make it work. Like, I see apps all the time where I'm like, I would have bet a million dollars that would have never gone anywhere. And somehow it's a hundred million dollar company. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think my opinions are worth a whole lot if you're willing to invest it's, a lot. You're worth a ton. You're worth a ton. Yeah. 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 But, I, appreciate, uh, yeah. I, I like the first app idea a little bit better than that one. Just from a logistics standpoint, it seems yeah. a whole lot simpler. 
Interesting. Yeah, thanks for that. I thought it would be really fascinating. I was honestly thinking you were going to say, dude, those are both trash. But they're just things that came off the top of my head. So thanks for doing that. That was fun. So obviously, you're an incredibly disciplined individual. Just having talked to Caleb, I know that you're an extremely hard worker. You wake up really early. You work out. Um, you're just extremely motivated. So it seems like that's sort of an innate ability. But I also know that you've done a lot of reading and you put a lot of work in on the back end. So I'm curious, along the way, have there been some books that have really complemented that sort of innate ability that you already have? to work hard, to be disciplined, and to hustle. Yeah. Um, well, I thank you for those those compliments. I don't know if I'm, I don't see myself necessarily as a crazy disciplined person, but it's kind of funny. The reason why I always talk about like discipline and stuff and trying these different things is because I feel like I realize how undisciplined I am and how much I need it. And so yeah. I try and do all these things to make myself more disciplined because I see it as a weakness. So and I think it's funny when some people like Caleb and stuff like that, I'll say, hey, he's really disciplined. I, I appreciate that. I hope I'm getting more disciplined. <laughs> but I focus so much on that because I realize how poor I am at that naturally. and I need to get better at that. But yeah, absolutely. There's some books that have helped me with that. So how many books do you want? Uh, uh, let's give us a, give us like a, maybe top three or top five. Maybe one yeah, top three. Maybe so, goals. Yeah. I have a bookshelf right next to me. I'm looking at this one <laughs> looking out the side here. He's looking at his Amazon inventory, everybody. Yeah, yeah. So this is one I've talked about quite a few times, but okay. it's the Daily Stoic right here. This is by Ryan Holiday. So this is the one of the ones that kind of caught me by surprise a while ago. So it's almost like a devotional type thing where it's like each day of the month, each day of the month, you have a, something you read out of it. And it's like a one page thing. It doesn't take long to read. And it takes something from one of the Stoics of the past, like Seneca or Marcus Aurelius. It breaks it down, what they said, and then kind of the meaning of how you can apply it to your life. Uh -huh. And one of the things that really drew me to Stoicism was one of the things that they're known to be very disciplined people. And so that's what originally I was like, hey, what is Stoicism about? What is this kind of path? And what I really realized is a lot of Stoicism is really just about learning to control what you can control and release what you can't release. Right. And once I really started getting into this and kind of reading this book, I realized how much of my time I spent either worrying about things I had no control over or I just didn't focus on the things I did have control over. And if you spend your time worrying about stuff you can't control, but not doing the things you can, you're going to feel trapped. You're going to feel like you're stuck. You can't do anything. Right. Um, you're going to feel like a victim all the time. But if you just take those lenses off and say, hey, I might hate this right now, but I can't control that. What can I control? It really opens your eyes, especially from a business standpoint. Because in your business, you're going to face problems all the time. If you have business partners, there's never a perfect partnership. Right. Um, Caleb and I and David love to work together, but of course there's conflict at times and stuff like that. Right. And so if I think, oh, I can't do this because Caleb or because David, and then yeah. I feel trapped in my own business. But if I'm like, hey, I can't do that, but what do I have control over? What can I do? Right. What can I contribute? And often you figure out there's a whole lot more you can do than you think you can do. So Daily Stoic, I highly recommend this book. It's really simple. You don't have to go into the deep readings of all the different Stoics because those are pretty intense reads and very long books. Right. This is like a nice little snapshot for people that aren't as smart <laughs> to be able to go through like me. And get the get the get the gist of it and have someone explain it to you versus right. having to kind of try and figure it out for yourself. Book acts right here. I'm almost done with this book. So this is a new one, but I really, really like just the overview. So this one's called The War Warrior Poet Way. This is by John Lovell. John Lovell's a, a YouTuber. Do you know who he is? I do not know. I'm okay, not. So he's a YouTuber. He was in the military. He was an army ranger. He has a gun channel where he does a lot of guns and stuff like that. I, I like guns. And so I followed his channel a long time ago. But this book is kind of like um, talking about warrior poets and how every man is really based for men specifically. How every man needs to be a warrior on one hand, but also a poet on the other hand. And you have to balance these two lives to have successful business, to successful marriage. And for me, it's just a really, really good breakdown of, to me, what it means to be a man and how to live and how to manage these two different aspects of your life. And so I really like this mainly as a reminder. It's not a whole lot in there that I'm like, oh, I've never heard this before, but it's right put together in a way that's like, hey, this makes more sense. And yes, I need to focus more on this. And I'm really slacking in this area or I'm actually I'm doing pretty good in this. And he's very much of kind of the Stoic philosophy as well. So he brings in a lot of those, the Stoic principles into this. He's also a Christian and brings in a lot of scripture and stuff like that. And so that's been a really, really good book. I'm like probably 12 pages, 15 pages from being done with that. So I'm gonna finish that one awesome. tonight. And then the last one, this one I've also mentioned quite a few times is just Jocko Willing's book, Extreme Ownership. Mm -hmm. Okay. I read this a lot of times uh, through probably, I should say a lot, I've probably read this three different times over the years. Okay. Um, just because I personally, I don't know if it's just the way I learn. I'm a slow learner maybe or something, but you know, like if I get through a book and it's sometimes books should only be read once. I think there's books out right. there that are good, but you can kind of get the gist of them in not as much time and they're good. 
some books I feel like you read it and you're like, there's so much information in that, that I'm not going to yeah. be able to apply all that if I just stop there. And so a few months later, I'll reread the book and like, Hey, I've learned a whole bunch. I missed the first time type thing. Right. This is one of those books. But ultimately, one of the things I liked about this is it really lined up perfectly with kind of that daily stoic thing of extreme ownership is really about taking ownership on what you can control. It's the same exact philosophy right. of everything is your fault in a good way. And that means right. you can change it. And so it's not ever about your business partner, your boss, about your spouse not doing what they're supposed to. It's, hey, what am I doing wrong? What can I do to improve the situation? There's always something you can do. You always have a choice. And I love how he okay. explains it in very much business terms. It's not where it's like a stoic philosophy and you have to kind of figure out how to apply it to your life. He like takes that and molds yeah. it to, hey, in a business situation, here's exactly how you lead and how you win a business. His in-person event, I can't talk highly enough of, I love that in-person event. He does these, the extreme ownership kind of leadership summits across the country. Uh -huh. They're a little pricey. But if you get the chance to do it, it's like three days and it was great. I had, I rarely take notes on things because I'm just trying to remember it, but I had like right. notebooks full of notes from this thing. And wow. I still look back on today. I think it was at the end of 2020, I went to that event um, and it was really, really good. And also you get the chance at the end, if you want to, to do a workout every single morning, of course, 4.30 a.m. to get everyone out there and do a workout together, which was interesting. It was fun, but it was also on asphalt. And so all the push-ups and everything hurt, but it's part oh, of the final thing. Yeah. Jocko Willink. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. And then at the very end of the, the seminar, he's very big into jujitsu. And so people can go to their first jujitsu class if they want to. And it was really cool because I was actually out there with him. He was helping me and this other guy. He was actually helping roll and teaching us how to roll together and stuff like that. It was actually Jocko sitting there helping me and this other guy, which was kind of cool that well, that awesome. happened. So there's some definitely benefit to going to those in-person events. And I was able to talk to him one-on-one -on -one that event too, which is really cool. I got lucky. The the kind of funny story, they have a big separate room aside from the auditorium where everyone went to eat, but every chair was taken in that entire building. Uh -huh. So I took my plate and I went back to the auditorium where they're doing the teaching and stuff like that. I was like one of four people in there, but I brought my plate of food in there. I noticed Jocko had just finished his food. He was sitting on the side of the stage just with no one around him sitting there. So I got up there. I was able to talk to him for probably like 10, 15 minutes, just one on one. Uh -huh. And then I, I looked back and there was like 50 people behind me because they noticed he was up there. Yeah. And so everyone else behind me just got a photo and a smile and a few sentences with him. But I got lucky, got him at the right time and got to actually have uh -huh. some one, one time with him, which which was really, really cool. So. That's one of the reasons I like this book so much. But yeah, those three books. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for those book recommendations, none of which I have heard. So everyone check those ones out. Uh, we are getting an hour to an hour on time. Uh, obviously, this has been very valuable. I've learned so much. I also always love delving into building softwares and apps because I think eventually one day I would like to go there. But uh, just obviously getting to meet Matthew was, also, was awesome last um, at the last uh, earlier this year at the Miami Sellers Conference. And I know that now that you sold Scott IQ at eFlip and New Price, you're kind of on the sidelines and you're, I, I'm sure you got stuff cooking. So could you just give us a quick brief description? What are some of the things that are going on in your head right now? Because obviously you're not somebody who's going to sit still and do nothing. You got plans. So what is that yeah. you're kind of thinking of doing in the future? Yeah, well, one of the things I'll fully admit that I was kind of, I guess, not scared for, but just aware of when we were selling Scout IQ is that I knew as an entrepreneur, some you ever always have that shiny object syndrome. I'm like, right now, Scout IQ, it's easy because I just keep diverting my focus. Hey, this is what's working. This is what's doing. Let's focus on this. I knew once I was taken away, it's like all opportunities are open. It's very difficult to decide what you actually want to focus on. So right. I had to mentally prepare for that a little bit. And I'm still going through that where you see all these opportunities and you know, to be successful, you have to focus on one. Right. To be the most successful, I think you really have to devote your time to what I hate splitting my focus amongst a million things. And so I haven't quite figured out what that one thing I want to focus is on. I do know, though, that I love software because of its predictability. I love the subscription model. Um, there's a lot of great businesses out there that you can make a lot of money with, but they're a lot more difficult to keep running and going. Like right. I have, I know a guy that has, um, he does garage floors and does the, what is it called? Epoxy for garage floors. And it's like, it makes good money. There's a lot of profit margin in it, but people only need that once. And then you got to go chase the next customer the next month and then find a whole new set of customers the following month. I love with software. I can make an ad, take myself out of the product where I don't have to fulfill every single product. And then you can have reoccurring revenue that you're very predictable each month. I love that model. So that's why I might go back to software. I think in one way, shape or form. Um, and then as far as the software I'm pursuing, there's a ton of different ideas that are going through my head. I know Caleb has a few and we have some overlapping ideas, I think, because he was talking to me a little bit about that this yeah. morning. So I think we're probably going to do something together, uh, at least one software together or an investment in a business. It'll probably be software related. 
And both of us are very attracted to the financial space because I think like a lot of people, we see a ton of problems with it. And there's a lot of annoying things we both experience in the financial space. Yeah. And also there's not as much of a limit to growth in that space. With Amazon, I think we could have grown Scout IQ a whole lot more, but they're going to be limited by what you can do with books and selling on Amazon. And that's not going to be a billion dollar business selling used books on Amazon from a software standpoint. Right. But a financial company does have a lot more growth potential like it, like that. Gotcha. So right now, I've got a few affiliate websites that I make money from. I've messed around. I think I made a video on Amazon. I did it on Amazon. Yeah, I watched it. That was a good video. Yeah. Yeah. And so like something like that, it's just a fun pastime type thing. I like doing that. I'm a, I get the honor of being a guest speaker at my college. I graduated from each semester. And I always like to start these kind of random side businesses because they're easy things to talk to the students about. Like, hey, you're going off starting your first job. The class I do is right before they graduate. Right. And I can say, hey, if you've got a great career lined up. That's great. If you want to be an entrepreneur, hey, here's some ideas for you, something you can start on the side and get some foundational work. And Amazon, that um, influencer marketing thing that they're doing right now is one of those early social network type things I think of because they're new into video, they're new into the space, they don't know what they're doing yet. Things are very random and unpredictable because of it, but there's a whole lot more opportunity because very few people are doing it. And that's how I can make very few videos. And last month was about $3,000 just on those Amazon influencer videos. Oh my God. And that's crazy. This month, this month is looking a little lower. So it went up really fast. This month's looking like it's probably not going to be 3000 but still. Either way, there's a lot of opportunity and things like that. And so I love those side things, but really I ultimately want to get back and start another software business. So I'm just mulling through ideas to figure out what's the best thing to spend most of my time on because there's a lot of things I could focus on, but got to narrow it down. So yeah, that's crazy. I've actually tried to apply to that program. I keep getting denied. So I'm not sure if my following is really? not big enough. Yeah, I keep getting denied. So I'll have to that's figure out. That's random things about the program is I've, some people just get approved randomly and other people. Yeah. My sister got approved instantly. And I have a brother-in-law that's trying and he's getting disapproved every single time. So it's, yeah. it's, it's weird how they go about it. But yeah, I don't know. But uh, Matthew, thank you so much for, for coming here. You had insane value like always. And I just want to say thank you uh, for being here. So everyone else, that's all we got for today. The goal is can we get David Chung on the channel as well? That would be awesome. Um, Me too. The three amigos of the Scout IQ and, and E-Flip. So thank you so much again, Matthew, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Goodbye. Yeah, thanks for having me on.